Okay, so Jamie Van Susteren is getting ready for her big girl job interview in her stark black suit with a crisp white iron button down shirt. So I look like Jamie Van Susteren, the FBI TV agent, all right? Not to mention, I was in the military at the time. I was in the Army Reserves, and I had my hair slicked back in like a cop butt, right? So this is what I look like, just to give you the visual picture. I get to the parking lot, I park my car, and then I become Jamie Van Suster, an FBI agent, and the bag lady, because I had my purse. I had a really giant tote bag with all the things in it. I had a pad folio that wouldn't fit in my tote bag. And then I had a bottle of water. So Jamie Van Susser and the FBI agent in the bag lady is walking into this interview. And a little context for my background. I'm a country gal. I grew up in the sticks in the middle of nowhere, Oklahoma, in a place you've never heard of, right in between Blake Shelton and Duck Dynasty. All right? So Jamie Van Susser and FBI agent bag lady, country gal, is walking into a biopharmaceutical company in Cambridge, Massachusetts, for my first big girl job interview, I didn't prepare at all. The interview probably, as you can figure out, didn't go so very well. I go inside and I'm nervous and you can tell by the way I look, and you can tell by the way I am right now because I just didn't do any research on how to prepare because I'm kind of halfway well-spoken and I can do this, I can wing it, right? Um, no preparation, I go in. The hiring managers, were, they were incredible. Um, there were two very nice gentlemen, very patient and understanding. They could tell I was green. They brought me into a conference style room, which is pretty typical with the, t you know, the table with 10 or 15 chairs. And I'm walking around like, where do I sit? Where do I put all my bags? Oh my God, right? And so I finally figured it out. I sit down and then the nerves start to set in. I am clueless, I'm unprepared. They do the job interview. I'm a shy person at this time. I hadn't really come out of my shell yet. You know, Jamie had only seen the army in the back of a farm, right? And so I did the job interview. I didn't totally blow it, but I didn't really do well either, right? I'm somewhere in the middle. But I was so nervous that I was sitting kind of like this under the table, picking at my fingers until I was bleeding. So the one perk from that day about wearing a black suit was that I was able to wipe it off on my black pants and try to hide the blood on my fingers from where I was picking at myself, and I was so nervous. Uh, after the interview, I asked where the ladies' room was. I went in there, let's just move real quick, so hopefully the hiring managers wouldn't see. Then I say, thank you so much, shook their hands and left. My fingers kept bleeding in the car, but lo and behold, I walked down the stairs, they're escorting me out of the building, because it was one of those places where you gotta sign in and saw top secret. And I see my competition sitting in the lobby, She's beautiful. She's got on the perfect little interview get up. She looks business casual, very professional, adorable. And I can tell she's a lot more confident than I am, right? Needless to say, I'm pretty sure that gal got the job and not me. Um, and for a little tiny bit more context, this was a biopharmaceutical company, shy little Jamie Van Suster and the FBI agent interviewed for a very intensive sales internship. I'm shy. Remember that part. I was totally out of my element. I was totally out of alignment. And I was in the wrong place at the wrong time in the wrong outfit. And I did not prepare a lick. So that's how that interview went. And the irony is now that 10 years later, when I went on to discover my true calling in life in helping other people get jobs, now I'm teaching you how to get, how to do a job interview. And the biggest thing I always teach is preparation. So that's what we're gonna talk about mostly today. Uh, there are four parts to the class. We're gonna focus on number one preparation the most. I will touch on the final three a little bit, and then I will let you move on to lunch. All right, ladies, and is there any gentlemen in the room? Nope, just ladies. And while I'm at polling the room, is everybody military, civilians? What are, what are you guys, military spouses? Spouse, mostly spouses, some civilians? No civilians. One civilian, both, okay. I can pick on you then. All right. All right, so here are the four objectives of the class. Again, I said the first thing is the most important, preparation. And the final three, what to wear. I'm Stacy London today. Knowing thyself 
And then the final thing is how to knock their socks off, all right? Those three things are important. I don't have a whole heck of a lot of time, so we're going to touch on them, and we won't go and deep dive into them. All right. So hopefully there's an even number of people in the room. I want you to turn to your neighbor that you do not know, not your buddy, and partner up. We're going to do a quick activity for five minutes, and then we'll start the class. All you're going to do for this activity is you're going to take two and a half minutes each, and you're going to ask yourself the interview question, tell me about yourself. You're going to all right how was that tell me how your interview experience was right now and there were some people there were some people that were talking a whole whole lot and they were like oh what's up i didn't even realize and then there were some people that were looking at me like I'm done, it was only 15 seconds, right? And so I just, uh, yes? I stand up in front of people and present myself. Uh -huh. But when I'm sitting across the interview table, I stumble all over my words because standing up and presenting myself is different than what should we be talking about in that five minute mm -hmm. It's It's, I wanted to test you on several things. First of all, I took a couple selfies and I got you guys in the background, just so you know. Um, I wanted to observe your natural body language in an unnatural setting. Uh, everybody was all over the page with their body language. All right, we had some people that were really shy and confirmed. We had some people that were just like an Italian over dinner, right? Yeah, so this will, we will get into this whole thing about knowing thyself towards the end of the class, but I want you to reflect and then maybe your partner as well can get together just for a moment and talk about your body language. Uh, everybody, it's a group full of women. Almost everybody was smiling. So that is really good. You all get an A++ for that, all right? Uh, and then more importantly, I couldn't hear a darn one of your answers. So I don't know how those went, but I'm sure you can gauge yourself whether you thought it was smooth, rough, need some work, and then you and your partner can discuss it as well if you need to polish out the edges, right? So that activity also gives me an indicator on how you are, maybe when you're nervous with a stranger. Does time go really slow? Or does it speed up really fast and you're done in 15 seconds, right? And this will give you an indicator during your job interview on how that pacing is going to go. Because pacing and capturing attention and maintaining the interest is hugely important during a job interview, all right? So the activity is over. Um, what I want to do next before I dive headfirst into the class is introduce myself a tiny bit uh, because you're just sitting here wondering who is this crazy person talking about FBI agents and Greta Van Susteren telling me what to do today, right? Um, so my name is Jamie Chapman. I'm an entrepreneur and I own a business where I do this. I teach people how to do job interviews, how to write resumes, how to get into the federal government, and I also own a staffing company where we help people get private uh, get, get jobs with private organizations, right? Um, my team was voted the number one military spouse owned business in 2019. So that says that we are pretty good at what we do, right? Um, when, um, when it comes to things like this, uh, my preaching gospel with interviews is about flow and it's about storytelling and we'll get into that. But this a little bit of background on who I am professionally, literally after this whole Greta Van Susteren incident, I ended up finding my calling. I worked with special needs adults and my job was to help them get jobs. I then married a service member and I'm a military spouse, started working with soldiers in the army, helping them get jobs when they transition out. Now I own a business, I'm doing this over here in Germany and that's kind of the brief career background on me. Um, and that's the background of how I know a thing or two about interviews comparatively to my story about being an FBI agent. So that's who I am. Um, we're going to talk about preparation. Does anybody want to tell me how they prepare for a job interview? All right. How about you, Kendra? Uh, I look at the job description and I pick out relevant things that I've done and I 
cater my interview as to that job, as to my experience, and I tell them what I've already done and tell them what I'm capable of doing in that job. Okay. What about you? I research the company um, that they're doing with and see what they're doing recently, things that they're doing specifically or around what I'm applying for, so they're looking at their communications team, they look at their Facebook page and they have one, their Twitter, what they're at, what they're around. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah. What about you'd wear? Okay. We're going to cover that. <laughs> That's important. Anybody else? All of these are good answers. They all, it all wraps up into one final product, right? Your successful job. All right. So as I've preached, preparation is the foundation. Um, the kind of three basics that we're going to go over are your material right? Think about me. I'm giving up. I'm giving you a speech right now. I didn't just come in here winging it. I actually had to prepare my material, think about what I was going to say, how I was going to present it, think about what I was going to wear, all that crazy stuff. Uh, you brought it on. You were spot on. We got to know a little bit about the company. If it's the government, we have to know about the agency, their mission, what they actually do, what your job would be when you get there. And that helps you prepare questions for the interviewers. Um, and then there are a few no-nos. I won't di dive too deeply into the no-nos, but a few of them are dressing too unprofessionally, not preparing, having a terrible email address like iCandy2012 at gmail.com, right? Or I have seen Big Bala, you know, 2008. Yeah, right? I just can't stand it. It's always a pet peeve of mine. People don't even realize their email addresses are unprofessional. Just get it together. Your social media has to be cleaned up because they're going to research you before you come in for that interview. If they're investing the time to talk to you for an hour for an interview, I promise you they've already checked your Facebook first and then your LinkedIn second, all right? Unless it's the government, they can't check social media on the government computer. So there's just a couple of no-nos. Obviously, common sense applies. Um, and now we're going to get into what you do to actually prepare now. Okay, so this is, think of these three categories as the big overarching umbrella, all right? The big overarching umbrella is the types of questions you might get asked. You've seen the first one today. It is, tell me about yourself. I would say, just, you know, pulling numbers out of thin air, about eight out of ten interviews, you're going to get asked some variation of tell me about yourself. So, Kendra. Why don't you tell me a little bit about your background? Oh, so Jamie, can you tell me about your previous experience, right? You almost always get asked to sort of introduce yourself in an interview. The exceptions I've seen commonly are on the federal side of the house. If you're going through USA Jobs, the hiring managers have to abide by this strict rubric of questions, and a lot of the time, this ain't on it, right? So they'll just call you on the phone or it'll be in person, and they'll just jump straight into the hard stuff and you don't have a, a chance to warm up. So just be prepared. More than likely, you'll have to answer this, so you might as well come up with an introduction, all right? The next one is stress questions, right? Stress questions uh, are designed to freak you out a little bit, right? They're not testing you with a polygraph machine, but they are asking you to talk about something difficult. They're asking you a question such as, so tell me about a time when you had a disagreement with your boss. What was the result? Nobody on their own is going to, on purpose, talk about a disagreement with their boss. It's like a no-no. But they're going to make you do it. They're going to ask you a stress question. They're going to ask you about, this is sort of a disguised one, tell me about how you solve problems, right? You obviously have to talk about a problem to answer that question. Tell me about a time when you had to prioritize competing requirements. You have to talk about being overwhelmed to answer that question. So some of these are blatant. Tell me three of your weaknesses, All right? Some of them are a little bit more discreet. Tell me about how you solve problems. Then you got to talk about a problem, right? Be prepared. When you are preparing, I'm going to, the next slide will show you a ton of little categories. I encourage you to whip your phones out and take a photo. 
When you are answering each question mentally or preparing writing notes or however you do it, come up with a stress question answer, talking about the bad stuff and how you overcame it, and then talk about this next one, your time to shine. What time to shine means here is they are intentionally asking you to brag a little bit. They're talking about something where you're really proud of an accomplishment, where you got an award, right? They're asking you about something where you overcame a hardship and were victorious in that feat, right? Time to shine is them giving you permission and saying, hey, please brag. We need to know why you are the best for this job. We need to know your strengths. And you got to brag a little bit right now. And that one is where a lot of people drop the ball. They miss out on their opportunity to brag. They're a little bit too humble, and they don't knock people's socks off, right? So that's kind of the three overarching categories, the umbrella categories. This next one, this is the one you might want to take a photo of because I'm not going to read them all. These are the types of categories they will ask you about. These are the individual types of things. Just a single one out, leadership. If you have ever been in a managerial or supervisory position, or you are applying for your first one, you need to come up with your stress question and your time to shine question answer to leadership, right? You need to think of a time as a leader you failed, how you learned that lesson and overcame it, and now what you do so you don't make that mistake again. You need to come up with your time to shine moment as a leader where you really did a darn good job and you're proud of it and your team did something amazing, right? And so when you go through each and every single one of these categories, you need to think of a good and a bad answer. Now, I will be the first person to tell you, you don't need a hundred stories when you're preparing. You need to have at least maybe 10 or 15 good stories that you can remember. And then you can retrofit some of them to fit into these categories. Because they're not going to ask you 100 questions during your interview. They're going to ask you 10, maybe 15 questions at the most, unless it's some crazy interview I don't know about. Um, and then you can take your same stories and recycle them. You know, problem solving can go to the same prior prioritizing competing requirements question. That same story can answer both. Yes? Many of us have been out of the workforce for a while with all the stuff. How far back can some of our examples go? Because for me, I've been out of the workforce for over 10 years. And can I reference a teen situation when I was in high school or you know, first couple years of college? Is there like a timeline that you kind of... It's a great question. And during this job interview, here's the good thing. They aren't on a computer doing a background check. They aren't going to remember enough of what you say to go back and research to validate that your questions were true or how long ago they were, right? So there are no rules about your answers. Um, an example I'll share later is a story from when I was 19 years old. I still use it. Not that I do job interviews. I own my own company. I don't do job interviews now. But I would always use the same story no matter how long it had been, right? Um, if it's been a while and you have a huge gap on your resume, you can talk about your volunteer experience. Nobody cares if you were getting paid. It is viable experience, especially for the federal government. Um, if it's been a long time, you need to talk about things in some capacity, or you're just going to be sitting in there like, oh, sorry, guys, I don't have an answer for that, right? So, yes, yeah, so you can go back as far as you need to. To piggyback on that, how important is it to give examples? of stories that are applicable to your job or, or like I'm a hairstylist. I'm also getting my master's degree in accounting. And I'm sitting in an accounting interview and all of my examples are salon work. Of course you want to be relevant. They're going to ask you some technical questions. They want you to demonstrate your competencies and why you're qualified for the job. You may be a hairstylist, but you have all of these amazing soft skills that is required to be a hairstylist. You have customer service. You manage money because people pay you. So there's your, you know, whatever they ask you about how you handle money, you just remember like, you know, this week I made $2,000 and to rent my booth in the salon cost X, Y, and Z dollars. 
And at the end of the year, here was my total, here was my loss, blah, blah, blah. You have tons of material. Even if you are a cashier at the PX or the BX on the base, right? You have material to talk about. You just have to go and find it. The problem is, this is why we prepare on the spot when you're nervous. If you didn't prepare these stories in advance, you're not going to be able to go back in time and grab them and come up with a good example for the interviewers. So this is why we prepare stories in advance. And a pro tip here, um, I don't have it up here with me, but I have it today. You know the military gives you those little black journals? You know what I'm talking about? They're just like a little journal. It's black. It has the elastic thing, right? Take one of those in. If it's a it's a face-to-face -face interview, I have a memory like a goldfish. And if I want to go into a job interview, I can't remember the middle one of my three weaknesses. I just forget it, right? I just jot the buzzwords down in my notebook. I have it open in front of me. And then when I get nervous, I look down and I can remember my middle third weakness, right? It's like you always forget the things in the middle of the list. Or if you have a great story, like I have my notebook here, it's just one word so I can remember what story to tell you, right? If you have the buzzword in front of you, it's much easier to go back in time and pull a good story and example to tell them during the interview. That's a pro tip. You can bring a cheat sheet in, all right? Um, so these are great examples. Have a good and a bad example for each. Um, and then again, you can recycle those stories and tell them because they're not going to ask you 200 questions to cover each one of these. They're going to ask you likely the ones that came in the job announcement and what competencies they're looking for for that position. All right. This is a boring stuff. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> okay, so if you Google search how to do a job interview, you're going to see the first two. Almost always, every career coach that has a blog has these things in there somewhere. I do too, right? Um, CCAR and STAR are two really, really common formats to answer an interview question. Here's the kicker, though. I don't really recommend them because it's hard to remember. I put a little STAR by the third one because I made it up, and it's great. The third one is mine. I made this up. You're not going to Google search and find it anywhere because I made it up, right? It's PSP, and the gist of it is punchline, story, punchline. And the whole point of this is not to have to remember the situation, the task, the action, and the result. That's freaking a lot when you're nervous. You can't remember that. It has no flow, and it's clunky. That is not a good story to tell. When you're doing context, challenge, action, result, that's slightly better but still, when you get nervous, you, you know how you tell a story and you're nervous in front of people and you forget parts that you need to talk about? You always do that in an interview. And the reason I like the last one is because it simplifies it. All you got to do is remember at the beginning and end to tell them what the point was, right? You know how the military, they'll say, tell them what you're going to tell them, tell it to them, and then tell them what you just told them. That's what we're doing here. It's all about flow and ease. If you have prepared your stories, you have talked to your darn self like a batty old lady in your car a few times when you're driving by yourself, and you've prepared and got your flow down for these stories. If you forget parts, it's okay. The main thing to remember is to tell them the point up front and re-solidify what you just said at the end of your question. In the middle part, you're just telling a story. That is it. So it's all about flow, and it's about making it easy. And every single one of us, we're unique. We tell stories in a different way. We don't go in situation, task, action, result. Some people tell all the details in the beginning and get to the point at the end. This particular method, PSP, gives you permission to tell stories the way you like to tell stories. And that's the best way for you to make your own flow for this interview, all right? The PSP, that's the one I recommend. All right. Game of Thrones fans? Yeah. <laughs> All right. I love this quote. I'm going to actually read it. I read slides. I'm going to read this one. What unites people? Armies? Gold? Flags? Stories. There's nothing in the world more powerful than a good story. Nothing can stop it. No enemy can defeat it. That's the short guy in Game of Thrones. Yeah? It's not a spoiler. It's okay. It's just a quote. 
So the whole point of this is your flow. PSP, punchline, tell them what it means, tell them what it means to you, the story you're about to tell. Tell the story in your own dadgum way, and then tell them again what it means to you because they forgot because you told an amazing story in the middle. You got to remind them. The whole point of this is to be yourself and to be memorable. Because remember when I said in the beginning, you know, Jamie Van Susser, an FBI agent, I didn't do terrible, but I didn't knock him out of the park either. There's this scale. If they interview five people, they're going to hate one guy because he was too arrogant, right? They're going to love this gal right here because she told an incredible story about how she has five kids and she got an on-the-spot job interview while she was at Disney World with her infant in her arm and she did the interview in a smoking pit and they offered her the job. They're going to love that. And then there's going to be the three in the middle. And most people fall in the middle because they tell safe stories, they answer in a very boring blah, blah, blah way, and they don't tell the stories the way they tell stories, right? They go into the interview like I did, Jamie Van Susteren, and they just answer to the best of their ability without any preparation in advance. And they'll say, so Jamie, uh, tell me about a time when you handled a stressful situation. And you tell them, oh, there was this you know, one time at work when my team had a harsh deadline to meet and uh, we had a hard time. It was a really crazy way to stay up really late and get the job done, but we got it done. I mean, that interview is okay, but in five minutes, they're going to forget everything that you said, right? So I'm going to tell you, this is the one story I'm going to tell because I can get overwhelmed when I tell stories. This is the one sample punchline story punchline I'm going to give. And I'll try to keep it brief. The five Bs, that's the only rule. Be brief, baby, be brief, right? So you're an interviewer, and you're going to ask me this question. All right? Tell me about a time when you handled a stressful situation. Can you ask me that question? Tell me the time when you handled a stressful situation. Yeah. Uh, there was this time. I was 19 years old. I had just got my first job as a substitute teacher in an elementary school. Now, for a little bit of context, um, I was really green. The only person I'd ever worked for up until that point was my mama, and she owns a convenience store, and I dipped minnows out and gave them to fishermen. Um, so the best story, the main thing, is that a little bit of preventative maintenance goes a long way. I was green. They put me in the elementary school because I was 19, and they knew I would get eaten alive by high schoolers because I looked like one. So elementary school it was. I go marching in, clacking, clacking my little high heels. My very first day, my assignment was where an elementary school teacher had fallen and broken her hip, and it was a long-term substitute teacher assignment in a special needs kindergarten and first grade class. That was my first assignment. In substitute teacher world, special needs assignments are kind of some of the tougher ones, right? So I walk in, and there's a pile of papers about this thick on the desk where nobody was grading papers because there was no teacher for a while, and they had substitutes and some teacher's aides filling in. During nap time, one of the little gals was laying on her mat under her blanket, just flopping around like a fish out of water. Crazy. I, would, I was really distracted. I couldn't even grade papers, and I knew that little girl was keeping her neighbors away. And you don't interrupt nap time for sleepy kids, right? So I clackety-clack, I walk over to her, I lean over and I tap her, and I tell her, hey, I need you to be quiet, I need you to be still and rest, even if you can't sleep. So I turn around, I clackety-clack back over to my office, and then suddenly I hear her stand up. And out of the corner of my eye, I see something like flying. <laughs> and this young lady was stark naked. She had been taking her clothes off under her blanket on the floor. She flung the blanket around and tied it around her neck like a superhero cape. And before I had time to gasp, she was running out the door of the classroom. Dude. So anyway, I take off I'm running after her. I didn't know what else to do. You have a nude child in public here, and I'm going to get arrested, and they're going to call the police on me, and I'm going to go to jail, and I'm going to lose my job on the first day. Talk about stressful. 
So I ran down the hall. I busted into another teacher's classroom. I said, there's an emergency. Watch my class. They're sleeping. And I ran off chasing this girl down the green mile hallway. It was 10 minutes long. And she ran straight into the library. I yelled at the librarian, where that girl go? Because I didn't know her name. And so she, she pointed. The little girl had, don had bolted and locked herself into the librarian's private bathroom. Librarian's private bathroom, you can't unlock it from the outside because, hello, privacy in elementary school kids. I am definitely losing my job. There's a naked girl in this bathroom. We can't get her out. So I stay with the little girl. The librarian goes and gathers her clothes, gets the principal. The principal gets the janitor who had to remove the doorknob to get the girl out. We get her dressed. 19-year-old Jamie Chapman had never gotten in trouble a day in her life. And for the first time in my life, I'm walking down the Green Mile hallway to the principal's office. I was mortified. And so then I sit in there and the mom comes, collects the girl. And then finally, it's just me and the principal one-on-one. -on -one, and here it comes. She's going to call the cops and I'm going to lose my job. When the strangest thing happens, she laughs at me. I'm thinking, well, this is just wrong evil. How are you going to laugh at me before you fire me? This is not right. Then she proceeds to tell me. Oh, and by the way, this little girl has been this five or six times. And so to get to my original point, a little bit of preventative maintenance goes a long way. If you have the ability at work or at home to give someone a heads up they can change things for them later, by all means, please do it. And that's the end of my interview question answer, all right? So that's, that's how I tell stories. I'm dramatic and I overemphasize things, right? And I have to give myself the ability at least one time to wrap it up to the and tell a very, very big story. But the, the important thing is that you throw that, tell them what you're going to tell them. Preventative maintenance goes a long way. You tell this crazy, weird story that has nothing to do with preventative maintenance. And then you solidify your point at the end and you say, if somebody would have just told me this girl was a streaker, it would have been much better that day for me right? So that's what I mean when I say flow. You don't have to talk about child nudity in public and getting arrested, but you do tell stories in a certain way. And even if it's just about a work project, you tell the story in your own way, but you make sure to tell them why you're telling it to them in the first place and solidify your question answer, all right? So to skim past some of these other more important things, I don't have the whole time today. Um, Wearing clothes during your interview is really important. We don't want to go in there naked, right? But what the heck do you wear? Uh, I've heard some really trendy advice. Everybody in tech wears t-shirts, so you just go into your interview wearing a t-shirt, right? Or some people go dress like Greta Van Susteren. <laughs> There's a good balance to strike, but the most important thing you can wear is your attitude, your confidence. And just to briefly touch on it, there's a gentleman named Jordan Harbinger. He's an entrepreneur. He has a wonderful podcast called, uh, I forget the name, uh, The Art of Charm. He has this thing called the doorway drill, which is basically becoming aware of your body right before you enter somewhere because people make their first impression of you before the interview. It's when you're sitting in the lobby, when you walk in the door, right? So you got to put that body language confidence on before your interview, when you're getting out of your car in the parking lot and you're the bag lady with all the bags, right? You gotta look confident. You gotta own all those bags, right? So the doorway drill, just be cognizant of the way you look in the transitional areas, the hallways, the doorways, the lobbies, and all those weird places where people might see you before your interview, all right? Body language is, uh, in general, you look shy and you look nervous when you close up when you pick your fingers until you bleed under the table. You look confident when you are big and you take up territory, right? You see a CEO put their hands on the desk like this and they take up the desk, right? You see big body language in Superwoman or maybe Wonder Woman, right? Big body language, big territory looks more confident. Find your balance. Some people aren't big Wonder Woman type of people, but you gotta find your balance. <laughs>
All right. Uh, your clothing literally impacts your behavior. There are psychological studies that talk about you act better when you dress your best, right? And if you dress frumpy that day in sweatpants, you act like it's a sweatpants day, right? Clothing actually impacts your behavior. Um, there's a, some credence to researching the company because you can figure out if it's finance, are they across the old company where they all wear suit and tie, or is it more of a business casual environment? At a minimum, you always at least dress business casual, even if everybody else is wearing a t-shirt. Because by golly, this is an interview and you're there to impress them. All right? Um, and then I believe in dressing for success every day at your new job. Like when you knock their socks off at the interview, you dress as best as you can at work as well. You don't let it slide and start wearing Lululemon yoga pants to work, right? Uh, this I will not read. Uh, you can snap a photo with your phone. These are just my recommendations for men, and then the next one is for women. Mm -hmm. That's something really cool that happened with my attire when I was interviewing. I've had like two jobs in 10 years, and I ended up getting an interview blazer that made me feel like tall, like you said, that confident, and I put pearl earrings in, and I wore it for six interviews, and I nailed them all. And yeah. Goodwill, it was from the Goodwill. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And That's it's, great. It's just, it works. Confidence. It does. Uh, none of us are men. I'm going to flip to the women's one. Um, I just want to mention briefly, interviews are usually in a smaller room, in a conference room or something. You already wear hairspray. You already wear deodorant. Don't spray on perfume that day. People really get bothered by smells. I don't know why. They just really get bothered by smells. And if they hate your perfume or your cologne, they're going to hate you. They're not going to hire you that day. Just say though, I mean, that advice, um, I'd be very careful about following that so stringently because it really depends on the job. So if I'm going in for a partisan job with an advertising agency and they greatly value creativity, I'm not going to go in with a conservative dress. I'm going to go in with something that's a little bit more daring. I'm going to have some color. I might have a piece of jewelry that stands out a little bit. So I do think it's important to understand what you're interviewing for the job and what they value as a company. Because I've definitely gotten jobs where they've said to me afterwards that I can really tell you were a creative person and you really appreciated how you were dressed and you looked like you could really take things on. So I do think that that's important. It is important to know the company and to know their values. Uh, but always, if you're going to spice it up a little bit, be more on the conservative side because you don't know the age of the interviewers. You don't know if they're a millennial or if they've been around for a while. And you just don't know their personal preferences until you meet them and see them in person. So it's always better to be a little bit more conservative. Um, this stuff, knowing myself, um, I don't believe in faking it till you make it. I believe in being yourself throughout the interview process, starting from the resume and applying online all the way through getting that job. All right? So don't fake it till you make it. Be yourself. Tell stories in the way you tell stories. Don't, if you're shy, don't be a big real estate taken up person telling these big crazy stories like I told. Do your own thing and be yourself, all right? Be in alignment with who you are. Uh, be memorable. We want to be this guy at the top, not in the middle. We don't want to be the bad guy that they forget because you made a bad impression. Your cologne stunk, right? Um, and then finally, how to knock their socks off. Confidence. Being yourself. Being in alignment. Uh, and also, there's a fine line between being arrogant and being confident. We all know it. You know the guy that's a one-upper. Don't be a one-upper. All right? Um, and then this goes beyond the interview. Everything I'm telling you today can be for telling a speech in public. It can be for answering questions for a reporter in the news. It can be just, in general, for having conversations. The way that you do this uh, and the way you answer questions and the way that you show up at your job and do briefs and conferences and stuff like that. Uh, can affect your on-the-job performance. All right, questions for me? Yes? What are your thoughts on etiquette after the interview as far as sending thank you notes to your person? Um, hugely important. I always recommend a thank you note. In a government environment, sometimes secure facilities and stuff like that, you can't send a handwritten note. If it's at all possible to do handwritten notes, I like that. People think it's thoughtful. Uh, but an email is always needed. And then following up regularly just to make sure that they want to hire you is great as well.